What is this? A light bulb. What if you put a light bulb over a stick figure? What does it mean? An idea. How do you know this? Cartoons. Cartoons! You're exactly right, cartoons. You know, and, and I, I began to wonder that because I, it, it's a strange thing. How long has the light bulb been around? Oh, forever? Yes, you grew up with it, but you haven't been around forever. What, a hundred years or so? Not that long. And so I began to wonder, because it, it, it's completely unintuitive while, why taking a light bulb and putting it over your head would mean idea. And so I, I wondered about this, and so I, I did a little bit of research, and, and basically, so I found this, and those of you go to the internet and you Google, and it said, it became a cliche almost as soon it was in, as it was invented in the 1920s for the black and white Felix the Cat cartoons. So I looked up the Felix the Cat cartoons. They were very interesting. Um, yeah, it, because, because the funny thing about the Felix the Cat, well, well here, here's the thing. If you Google idea in a Google image search, look at how many of these things are light bulbs. That is strange. Because, because here's the problem with the idea of an idea. It's about as immaterial a thing as you can think of. If you think of horse, if you say horse, you think of a horse. If you say car, you think of a car. Say idea, there's no, there's no physical thing you can put your hands on. And so, but suddenly, somehow, this has become what an idea means. So I decided to do a little bit of research on Felix the Cat. And the first Felix the Cat movie was in 1919. Now, the Felix the Cat was basically flip art. And they're learning the, the skill of animation. And they didn't even call him Felix at first. It was in Feline Follies. And, and what really struck me right away when I looked at it was... When I watched, and you can find this on YouTube, you watch the first cartoon and it's just a cat. And, and the animators hadn't quite figured out, basically, you know, if you think about what animation was first when they figured out they could do this on movies, they had cartoons first, and so on a cartoon, to get a character to say something or think something, well, you know how it is, you get a little, you get a little thing like this, which means sound, but if you had like little circles and then a big circle, it would be a what? A thought. So this is the first Felix the Cat. And Felix is just kind of a normal cat. But look, already you have a little question mark over his head. And, and that tunes us into what he's thinking. And they called him Master Tom, as in Tom Cat. They hadn't even called him Felix yet. And, and what's really interesting is that in the, in, in the first cartoon, he's pretty, you know, it's not really a normal cat. He's kind of personified, but, but, but he's a cat. Now, what's interesting is that, again, in this first cartoon, the animators are trying to communicate with, with words in boxes, but as this develops, what they begin to see is that the animators are learning how to communicate in this new medium. And so you have these little eye lines in a lot of the early ones to help us know what's going on in Felix's brain, to know where he's looking. And you find this all along. And then, of course, you find the, the question mark, which lets us know what the cat is thinking. Because if you didn't have any of this stuff and you just had the cat, you wouldn't be able to communicate the story. But now, what's really interesting is that as Felix develops, look how he changes. What do you notice? His eyes are huge. Why are his eyes huge? Q. Q, yes? Expressive. Expressive. If, if you do, if you look at those, if you look at those uh, things about talking about smile, we don't really, we do smile with our mouths. But you know where we really smile? With our eyes. Our eyes communicate everything. So the animators quickly learned that it was all about the eyes. And notice no need no light one. And so what's 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 Felix thinking about? And you all get this easily. And how do you know it's a girl cat? 
eyelashes, the eyelashes, and the lips. You, you all get this immediately. Now, it's very interesting because while Disney came along and Felix had huge success and Disney needed a character and he couldn't use a cat because the cat was already taken, so what does he make? And the mouse looks just like the cat, except he's got round ears instead of pointy, but the body and the eyes and the mouth, got a little, he just basically ripped it up. And then of course, here we are. Mickey has an idea. And now, if you look at language, this is, you know, this is exactly the same thing. If, if I would say, would you please enlighten me, what do I mean? We all get that. Or, I have a bright idea. What do ideas have to do with brightness? See, bright is just more light. So again, this concept of light is, is deep and powerful. Now, I was, I was thinking that if we had a children's sermon, what I would do is I would have Reggie come forward. And, and some people want to know why I always pick on Reggie. And, and why I always pick on Reggie is actually because Reggie is a very good sport because I can't pick on him. And he doesn't get upset. But I would, I would probably have Reggie come forward and I would put, see, because all of you are adults, I can just say these words and you imagine it in your head. If I had children up here, I would act it out. And all of the teachers out there and therapists know exactly why, because children haven't quite developed this. But you all can imagine having Reggie come forward, putting, and putting, uh, putting a, a, a blind, blindfold him and set him loose in the room and all of you would be laughing because Reggie would be stumbling into chairs and doing things and, and we'd be trying to tell Reggie. I mean, there's lots of exercises and games and things like this that have to do with, well, it's just the obvious thing. If there's no light in the room, what? All kinds of things. You can't walk around. You can't do anything. Actually, if, if they plunge you into total darkness for an extended period of time, do you know what happens? Anybody know what happens? You go crazy. You very quickly, your brain lacking input starts to produce images. And guess what kinds of images it will likely produce? Your fears. What's that, Edie? Dark. Dark images, your fears, your anxieties, the things you are legitimately worried about. So if you want to make someone crazy, put them in a dark cell with no light and no input, and they will go crazy. Their mind will drive them nuts. In other words, you actually need light to live and to stay sane and to think. Now... So then I have a the question. What did we use before Thomas Edison? Because this bulb hasn't been around that long. Psalm 119. Your word, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, this idea of lamp and light has been around a very long time, and it is even associated with words. Well, 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 that makes no sense. Why would it be associated with words? Do you know why? This is a scenario that happens to me, and I talked a little bit about YouTube because this is I'm getting more of this stuff now. Someone will come to me and they'll say, Pastor. These are the things that are happening in my life. Okay, well, are you, part of it is they just need to talk about it, and that's why we have therapists and counselors to sit and listen to people talk, and that's what friends do for each other. But, but there's an implied question at the end of it, because we are all asking why. Why are these bad things happening to me? Now, as an objective person, you could say, do you live on planet Earth? Why am I getting sick? Are you a human being? Uh, now we're into expectations. But what are we looking for? We are looking for words that will answer the question. 
We were looking for words that will enlighten our situation. We are looking for words that will bring order out of the chaos of our lives. Now, chaotic darkness comes in when you hear the words, you have cancer. Or maybe you have, I mean, 20 years ago, I never heard of COPD. That's a new phrase. But now when we hear it, it's like COPD. That's scary. You have, um, or I'm with the IRS. Now, now, everybody here knows, I hope, that there's this phone scam that goes on where people call, and they don't sound like they're with the IRS, but I'm with the IRS, and, and you need to go down to Target and get $3,000 in gift cards and read me the numbers over the phone, and that'll pay your tax bill. And, and you know, just on the surface of this, does, do any of us imagine that the IRS gets paid in Target gift cards? No. But all you have to say are those three little letters, I-R-S, and everyone's, <gasps> and chaos reigns. And we lose our minds. And then it has happened more than once where I've sat down with someone and said, that is a scam. You know it's a scam. You know, just hang up the phone. Don't bother. But are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. But are you really sure? Yes, I'm sure. And I can give him lots of evidence. Look, the IRS says they will not call you. But how do I know? What's going on? This is how we are. I want a divorce. When you hear those words, your world stops. The Twin Towers have fallen. A nuclear detonation. The stock market has collapsed. An earthquake measuring darkness, chaos. And, and what do you long for when you hear this? You long for light, but it comes in the form of words. You know, for a long time, one of my images of chaos was right outside my office door. And, oh, you know, uh, every week had to deal with this, and, and, and all, many of you know the story. But, but to me, it was such a vivid depiction of us, because most of us have plenty of chaos, but we keep it in the house, and we keep it behind closed doors. And, and, and so sometimes it was just so amazing, because I'd walk out my office, and one day, you know, I just took a picture of him, because it was just so striking. He's got jacket on and these sunglasses and he's just sitting on top of his pile of chaos just talking about this and I thought this is a picture of us of all of us we just have our chaos more neatly hidden than everyone else last week we talked about John the Baptist preparing the way and we talked about what does it mean to prepare this week Actually, we're going to look at the Gospel of John, and as a preacher, this is a little frustrating because the, 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 the John the Baptist part is a repetition, and what do I know about y'all human beings that um, you like new things? And so I can't preach on the same thing two weeks in a row, but actually, it's very interesting what happens in the Gospel of John because what John does is he takes what is basically in Mark and he puts it in the middle of a song. You say of a song? Yeah, of a song. Most biblical scholars believe that the opening of the Gospel of John was probably a song that Christians sang before it was ever in here. And in fact, if you look at it in Greek, one of the things that, that you notice right away is the prominence of in Greek the word is, 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 is. And you see that in the, in the song section, and then when it switches to the John section, the verbs change, and then the verbs go back afterwards. So let's read it. In the beginning was the word, and it sounds like a song, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Notice the repetition. 
Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the ding, light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. That's how John decides to start the story of Jesus. He sets the stage. He's the narrator. In a sense, before the curtain opens, someone comes out and presents a song. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. Now here's, here's the crazy thing that you, you have to be kind of a Bible nerd to, to know and recognize John the Baptist. But in the first century, if you were at all connected with the Jewish community, everyone who knew, knew who John the Baptist was. He was a rock star. He was someone that everybody knew. And, and Jesus, well, not a lot of people knew him. So, so right away, all of the Gospels begin by engaging John. Because everyone knows John, but they all begin by saying, John pointed to Jesus. John wasn't the light. He pointed to the light. And even as I say that word, you all, you all get that. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through him the world was, uh, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, an audacious statement, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Now, if you know the whole Gospel of John, what you recognize is right here in the prologue, John is already starting to hit the themes of his whole book. He's setting the whole thing up. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. And, and the Greek there connects us with the stories of Exodus. He tabernacled among us. He made his tent in our midst. And right away we have this vision of this tabernacle and this pillar of what by night? Light and cloud by day. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He was before you? John was born first. Ah, but Jesus was before you, which is why he surpassed you. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, anybody who knows the Bible will read this and say, what is this business with word and light and creation and God? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And these are all, this is all language of chaos. That, that in Hebrew, the, the earth was tohu avohu. It was just chaos. It was the chaos when, when someone, when the doctor says to, now pardon me, Casey, it might be hard, but the doctor comes to your young husband and says, you have cancer. I'm only 40 years old. I'm not supposed to have cancer. But you do. Or this is the IRS. I, I, I paid my taxes. Or there's been an accident. Or I'm leaving you. Or how many different ors? 
Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, looking at the waters and just anticipating the glory he is about to make. And God said, what does he say first? Let there be light. It's the beginning. Nothing can happen until there's light. Spoken into being. This is so deep within us. It's before the ding on our head. It's before the question mark. It's before we all understand this stuff. It's deep within us. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated light from darkness. And we should ask the question, why does he allow darkness to remain? Oh, if I could answer that question. Isn't that the question we all ask? Why does he allow darkness to remain? Then you jump to the book of Revelation. And what do you discover in the book of Revelation? There is no night. Why is there no night? There's no longer a sun to govern the day and the moon to govern the night. There's no light night. Why is there no, no, no night? Because the sun is the light to the city. And there's no longer any sea. And a lot of people read the book of Revelation and say, well, I like the ocean. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is the beginning of the book when everything was darkness and chaos. And at the end of the story, everything is light and peace. Well, well, how do we get from the beginning to the end? The light has to come. And the word has to come. And the word has to bring order. And the light has to shine. Now, scholars will go through this and, and they'll, they'll recognize that, wow, when John used logos, he set the world, the, word, the Greek world on fire because Her Heraclitus had, had talked about, you know, fire and chaos and logos for Heraclitus in the 6th century meant order out of chaos. That's what logos was. And the Stoics were one of the, the large religious philosophical groups in the Roman Empire when the church goes out into us. Logos was the organizing factor. And then John the Baptist comes around and says, Logos became flesh. And the Greeks say, no. And John said, yes. One of the things that I found in Felix, what happens here? What's happening here? Think about this. There's something, he's, you know, the, the, the girl cat is being tortured behind the door and he's got to get to her and save her. There's a keyhole. Oh, I, the keyhole's too small. Fix the keyhole. Oh, oh! And when you think about this in terms of animation, he, Felix crosses the barrier, doesn't he? he? He takes what is of the cartoon realm, of the story realm, and puts it into the physical realm, and it changes the story. The word becomes flesh. I had to learn how to make animated gifs for this. It was interesting. <laughs> so that Roger didn't have to do anything back there. Where is the chaotic darkness in your life? Now, now here's the thing. That, that, that right away when Jesus comes on the scene, we are, we are tool users. And so when Jesus came on the scene and we saw Jesus' power, everything in our mind said, how can I wield Jesus to fix my problems. That is the natural first step that our hearts go to. And that's what everyone tried to do. How can I wield Jesus to fix my problems? But what they didn't understand is that we are dealing with the author of us and not a tool. And so what happened is first everybody's following Jesus and they're all excited. And then they start to get frustrated because they can't wield him. They can't control him. They can't dominate him. They can't be the author over him. And so what happens is that 
Jesus starts saying things that they don't like, and people start to leave. And then many, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And he looks to the twelve and says, do you want to leave too? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, who shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Oh. Did you ever notice the crucifixion story? From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness was over the land. Now the point they're making here is not, well, what was the weather when Jesus was crucified? That's not the point. Darkness was over the land. Why? The light was being extinguished. And, and, and who was... At about three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's noon! What have you done with the light? He's extinguishing the light. The Father is killing the Son. Why? Your minds jump to Genesis 22 and Isaac and, Je and, and Abraham. He didn't come to bring judgment, he came to bear judgment. He came to, the, the light came to bear the darkness. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Was John just interested in giving us the time? No. It was dark when Mary went to the tomb. Why was it dark? The light had been extinguished. On the evening of the first day when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. It was dark! You live in a world that is dark. But the light has come and the darkness has not overcome it. Why do we light candles? Early in the morning. What's, what's the thing about early in the morning? It's dark, but it's what? Getting lighter. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Your life, in the midst of your suffering, is witness to the light in the midst of the darkness. That's what you do. <coughs> Witness to the light, even as, even as it appears, the darkness is crushing it. You say, but pastor, I want Jesus to... Yeah, yeah, I do too. But you don't understand the time and your role. You witness to the light, even as darkness is crushing you. How did John the Baptist die? At the hand of Herod. How did Jesus die? At the hand of Pilate. The word becomes flesh. And his word becomes flesh in you. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I hope at the end of this sermon you go out into the world and you have new ears for all the ways that we hear about light. And when you hear it, you remember you are the light of the world. You are the light in the midst of darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. Lord, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, we, we are not the light. We bear witness to the light. But to the degree that you shine on us, we reflect that light out to the world. <clears throat> and Lord, so often that light only gets reflected in suffering, and which is exactly what we don't want to do. 
So we ask, Lord, for your spirit. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would give us the ability to trust you. To know that just as when darkness fell on Jesus' cross, it was setting up the light to shine. Help us, Lord, to believe. Help us, Lord, to point. Help us, Lord, to shine. Amen.